everyone, welcome to Logan's Mosh Picks. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Yes indeed, time for another rock and read. It's your lucky day, because today you get to hear chapter 7 of Red by the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar. Chapter 7 is called Van Hagar, a crossover chapter. Let's get started. I came off the tour. I was fried crisp. I cut off all my hair. I canceled the last four dates on the tour after I hurt my foot, twisted my ankle in Connecticut, and couldn't walk on it. I tried to do one show like that, gave up, and went home. We had done 90 shows that year. My Ferrari 512, the car from the I Can't Drive 55 video, was sitting in Claudio's and Polia's shop in Van Noy's, where I'd bought it. He was an Italian mechanic who doubled as a salesman. He's actually the guy I'm talking to at the beginning of the I Can't Drive 55 video. He didn't run a dealership or anything, but he'd buy a car for you. He used to work for Ferrari as a test driver. It took 9 months to get the 512 after I ordered it. They made like 12 that year. Anyway, after I had had the car for a little while, it needed a tune-up, which on these special cars is a very big, expensive operation. It's a really a race car, and a tune-up can cost as much as an ordinary new car. I went home without picking up my car. Eddie Van Halen drove a Lamborghini, a Countach, and Claudio worked on his cars too. Eddie saw my car at Claudio's and asked him about it. Hey man, nice car, he said. Whose car is that? Sammy Hagar, said Claudio. You should call him and get him in the band. Everybody knew that vocalist David Lee Roth had left Van Halen a couple of months earlier. He quit the band almost as soon as his little solo single, Just a Gigolo, started to do something. It was way too soon to say they were floundering, but their predicament was public knowledge. You got his number? Eddie said. At my house, the phone rang. It was Eddie Van Halen. Hey man, what are you doing? He said. I just came off tour and I'm just kind of nursing my foot, I said. Would you like to get together, come down and jam, he said, and maybe join Van Halen? Not really, I said. I'm burnt. I'd love to meet you, but... I'd only met Eddie briefly a couple times. We had done a couple of big festivals together, and he'd come to my dressing room. I'm such a big Montrose fan, he had said. What a nice guy, I thought. So humble and sweet. When you shook his hand, he was always holding yours with both of his hands and adding in a little bow. How about tomorrow, he said. No, man, I can't, I said. I'm burnt. A couple of days, at least. Let me call you back. We exchanged numbers and hung up. I started thinking, maybe if they're broken up, I could get Eddie in my band. I could use a gunslinger like him. Or maybe I'll just write some songs with him and get him to play on my next record. I was a big fan. But I hated Dave. The guy rubbed me wrong. I'm sure I rub all kinds of people wrong, so it's not like I'm putting him down. The guy was a great front man, great attitude and rock, and had an image from hell, but I just couldn't stand the guy. He was the opposite of what I believed in and what I am. First of all, the guy's not a great singer, and he acts like he's the coolest, hottest guy in the world, when to me, he looks gay. The guy was never believable to me. The call didn't come as a complete surprise. Ted Templeman had been the one to tell me that Roth had split a few months earlier, and at the time, I had told Betsy, they're going to call me. You watch. Who else were they going to get? There was Ozzy Osbourne, Ronnie James Dio, and me. When Eddie did call, I was sitting there with goosebumps on my arm. I went down to see him a couple days later. I walked into their place in Studio City. Alex Van Halen took one look at my short hair and started laughing. You look like somebody put a donut on your head and cut it off, he said. I had the side shaved and left just a little bit on the top. I was taking a year off. Alex was drunk on his ass. He was drinking a case of tall malt liquor cans a day. He pounded them too. He could shotgun like nobody. He always wanted to have contests. He would pass out a couple of times a day, wake up and shotgun two or three beers, crack one more, and walk out of the room. Eddie drank all day too. They both woke up, grabbed a beer, lit a cigarette, and that was the way they started their day. Midday around 4 o'clock, they would take a nap. They were both big nap heads. 
Eddie lived in a very humble house with his wife, Valerie Bertinelli, the actress. It was actually Valerie's house. Eddie just moved in with her. She also had another place, sort of a beach house in Malibu, and they split their time between her two homes. The main one, though, was up in the hills off Coldwater Canyon. It was just an ordinary two-bedroom house with a garage that he had converted into a studio. They called the studio 5150 after the police code for picking up a crazy person. It was not a rock star home and the studio was a dump. They were recording through a homemade board that could have come out of a Cracker Jack box built by engineer Don Landy. Landy could make the board sound brilliant, but he was a genius and knew how to work it. To anybody else, it was like a model airplane gear. The studio was filthy. Beer cans everywhere, ashtrays full of cigarettes. Don Landy had to blow away the cigarette ashes just to plug something into the board. The place smelled like the worst bar on the planet. I don't think it had ever been cleaned. Eddie's guitars were lying on the floor. Nothing on racks, nothing in cases, just on the floors, on chairs, leaning against amps, against the wall, a pile of them in the corner. It was beautiful, but I would never seen anything like it. Eddie walked in wearing a pair of those shades with louvers in it. He had been up all night drinking, trying to write some music. I didn't know these guys. I didn't know what their routine was. But they were beat up. Eddie was wearing a pair of wrinkled pants. When I went into their house later that day, I saw why. He and Valerie were living out of their suitcases. They had been off the road for a few months, but they didn't have their stuff hanging in their closets. It was sitting in their suitcases on the floor. There were piles of stuff everywhere. It was weird. They could afford maids, but they didn't have them. They were kids. If you really look at it, they had been out on the road for five years and had only recently come home. Eddie never bothered to unpack. He was always pulling clothes out, finding something halfway clean but wrinkled. I found all this kind of humorous, like, far out, these guys really don't care. I thought that was pretty cool. I came from a different world, Betsy's world. My clothes were pressed. My socks were ironed, folded, and put in the closet. I was actually wearing a suit, Armani linen jacket and slacks, t-shirt and tennis shoes, kind of like Miami Vice. I ate in good restaurants and drank fine wine. Eddie would throw a hot dog and bun out of the freezer in the microwave, nuke it, plow it into his mouth, and chug it down with a beer. There were old pizza boxes lying around. The refrigerator was full of frozen burritos. Al was the crazy one. He was obnoxious, drunk, making comments, laughing about stupid things, smoking cigarettes. Here, he would say, shotgun this beer. I don't drink beer. When I got there, they'd been up all night writing. They had what became summer nights and what became good enough. Eddie Allen, the bassist Mike Anthony, had stayed up jamming. I arrived at about noon, and they still hadn't been to bed yet, and they were ripped. They'd been drinking the whole time. I went down to check on Eddie. In my head, there was no way I was joining Van Halen. We started playing, and the engineer Don Landy recorded everything we did. I made up the first line on the spot, Summer Nights and My Radio. I had just popped into my head the first time I heard that riff. The rest of the song I scatted my way through. I did the same thing with Good Enough. I really had my scat together. Eddie couldn't believe it. Dave apparently didn't have good rhythm and wasn't a great singer. Didn't have any range. I was singing Eddie's guitar licks with him. After five hours, they were freaking out. We got a band, they kept saying. I don't know, I said to them. It sounds great, but let's talk about it. Maybe I'll come back next week or something. They wanted me to stay, but I went home and took a cassette. We jammed a blue song, and we had the other stuff that we worked up. After dinner, I put the tape on my stereo. I got goosebumps all over my body. I heard it. I realized it was Cream all over again, my favorite rock band ever. There was something about it that was slow, confident, almost majestic. My rock had always been more intense. They were relaxed into this groove thing, even if it was up-tempo. Alex lay back like Ginger Baker always did. Eddie played the way Clapton did, deep in the pocket. He didn't speed up anything. I had never played with guys like that before. I called Ed Leffler and told him, I'm doing it. He told me I was crazy. He thought Van Halen's were nuts, and that I was crazy to even think about doing it. Then he went right back to work. Let me see what I can do, he said. 
Leffler looked over their situation. Those guys were in bad shape financially, and they had made a lot of money, but they had spent it all. They went overhead like crazy. When Leffler found out how much the guys made the year before, he told me I was going to have to take a pay cut to join the band. But once we started playing the music, I knew it was all going to happen. Eddie was a man of few words. His favorite line was, yeah, yeah, yeah. All he cared about was getting some rest, having a couple beers, some cigarettes, and playing music. Eddie wasn't really a driven musician. At one point, making the first album, I grew nervous with his nonchalance, his lack of concern for the whole thing. It wasn't like he was the musical genius telling everybody what to play. Al played the way he wanted. Mike was playing what he wanted. Eddie didn't even know what the lyrics were. He was just concerned about his guitar part. That's all he paid attention to. When I wrote the song, Love Walks In... His wife, Valerie, was so in love with the first ballad they had ever done, she made him listen to the lyrics. He got all choked up. Wow, I never listened to lyrics before, he said. He couldn't sing you one song. He didn't even know what Dave was singing about. He was listening to his guitar and the groove and making sure that his part was okay. Mike was my Ed McMahon, always ready to back the play, whatever it was. Eddie and Al were tight as nails. They didn't get too far from each other, pass their cigarettes back and forth. One wouldn't light one without lighting one for the other guy. They only needed one match. They never walked into the room with just their own beer. They always had a beer in their pocket for the other guy. It was beautiful unless they'd start fighting. Then it was terrible. When they were both drinking, they'd fight at least once a week. I mean, go at it fist fights. Mike and I would try to pull them apart. We'd break them up and leave. Al would drive back after we left and they'd go at it again. The next day we'd come to the studio. The windshield would be busted out of the car. The trash can turned over. I didn't see much of Eddie's wife, but Valerie, wow, what a cool chick. I pulled into the driveway one time and Valerie and Eddie were sitting on the hood of one of Ed's cars drinking a beer. I thought that was so cool. My wife would never do that. Valerie could hang with the boys. She wasn't around a lot because she was working. She pretty much always had a gig, some kind of little movie or TV part. She also spent a lot of time at their beach house. The sense of family ran strong in Van Halen. When I first joined, their father Jane was always there drinking and smoking. Mike Anthony was the most loyal dog on the planet. He was the flag bearer. From the start, they trusted me and I became the motivator. They loved that, and they rallied behind me. It was very family, very close. Us against the world. This is our place. We're working on our record. We didn't argue about nothing. It was a dream come true. Still, there was a lot of doubt about Van Halen. At the time, no one seemed to have confidence in the band's future. Roth had split with the road crew, the management, and he looked like he was going to launch big time on his own and leave the band in his dust. People were suggesting that we call it Van Hagar, which was a terrible idea. Funny though, I didn't know it at the time. Dad always claimed to be Irish, but we were actually Dutch, and our family name may have really been Van Hagar at one time. In spite of the doubt, we already knew it was going to work, because we were the ones in the studio working up the 5150 record, and we knew we had some killer tracks. We had Why Can't This Be Love? However, nobody but us had heard any of this because we couldn't tell anyone that we were even in the studio together. Everything had been taking place in secret because I was signed to Geffen and Van Halen were on Warner Brothers. Although we didn't know it, Geffen and Warner Brothers were already butting heads. As Geffen's distributor, Warner Brothers was taking 50% of Geffen's earnings and I was Geffen's biggest artist at that time. Elton John hadn't worked on Geffen's label. Neil Young was a disaster. Geffen ended up suing him. Donna Summer didn't have any hits for him. There was me, Don Henley, who had one big album, and John Lennon, who died shortly after giving Geffen his first album, although it did sell millions after he was shot. Geffen wasn't likely to let his biggest act walk across the street just because he wanted to sing with another band. Leffler and I went to see David Geffen. As expected, he did not like the idea and wanted to talk me out of it. Why would you want to be in that band, he said. You're as big as them on your own. He was baffled. He was sitting on his desk, his hand on his head. I don't understand this, he said. Like a lot of people, he thought David Lee Roth would be an impossible act to follow, and he said so. 
After a few minutes of talking it through, he shifted his tone suddenly. I would never stop an artist from doing what they want to do, he said. I'm David Geffen. I stand up for the artist. I'm for the artist. Number one, it's about you and your life. He said he would talk to Mo Austin, the chairman of Warner Brothers Records. With Warner Brothers over a barrel, Geffen told them he would let them have me for one album if he could have a Sammy Hagar solo album immediately following. He wanted 100% of the solo album and 50% of the Van Halen records on Warner Brothers. Warner's chief, Mo Austin, came to Eddie's 5150 Studios to talk things over. He was, let's say, cautious. He suggested changing the band's name, and he also liked the Van Hagar idea. Eddie and I powwowed about it and decided, no, we're Van Halen. We loved each other. There was no animosity, no egos, no nothing. They wanted me to be in this band, and I wanted to be in it because we were making the music, and we knew we were good. Mo asked if he could hear something, so we put on our instruments, and while he sat there, we played Why Can't This Be Love for Him, live and in person. He put his finger in the air and smiled. I smell money, Mo said. By the time we got the green light from Warner Brothers and Geffen, we were already halfway through the record. After that, we went full force and things started happening fast. Eddie and Al had a lot of music left over from what would have been the next Van Halen record before Roth split. They had a lot of sort of semi-formed ideas when I walked in on it. I had to write all the lyrics and melodies. I worked on their jams, picked them apart, and made songs out of them. I was kind of behind the eight ball in the lyrics. We would jam in the studio for hours. I would have a handheld mic and headphones and would just sing and experiment. When something was good, I'd point at the engineer to tell him to make a cassette. I would take the cassettes of the parts that I wanted to keep with me when I drove back to Malibu, which was about an hour's drive. I would drive home, ears bleeding, and listen to the songs. Both Ed and Al smoked in the studio like chimneys. Those guys would be lighting them up, setting one down, light up another, put it in an ashtray. There would have been three or four cigarettes going at one time. There were chain smokers lighting a cigarette off the other cigarette, letting the filter burn in the ashtray. Never put them out, dropping them on the floor. I'd have these terrible headaches when I'd get home at 3 o'clock in the morning and go straight to the shower because I stank like cigarette smoke. One night on the drive home, I was listening to this tape where Eddie had written the music and noodled the verses on guitar. He was trying to show me the phrasing in the verses, but he couldn't, because he couldn't play the rhythm and lead at the same time. I didn't get what he was doing, but on the way home, I heard the rhythm of the thing, and I started singing in the car. We didn't have a chorus, and I just busted out with it. Best of both worlds. It hit me hard, right when I was pulling in the garage. Bang! The chorus hit. I went in the shower, but I kept coming out to dry off and write some more lyrics on a notepad. And then I'd get back in the shower and get right back out to scribble down some more. The song came to me like a flood. I don't know about lyricists. Lyricist Bernie Tompin once told me that it's the easiest thing in the world for him. Once he has a title and a concept, he can just go bam, 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 bam. It's done. This song was coming at me like a tidal wave. I couldn't even take a shower. Usually I get pieces that I can remember. I just keep singing them over in my head and write them down later. I wrote the whole song while I was still taking the shower. I went in the next day and sang it. Everyone was blown away. That was the best of both worlds. Before I wrote Love Walks In, Eddie had never really played a real keyboard ballad in his whole life up to that point. With Roth, the closest thing was Wait off 1984, which was a sync track, but it was a rocker. It wasn't a beautiful melody. I had been reading this book by Ruth Montgomery called Aliens Among Us. She claims to be an automatic writer. She just gets a pencil, closes her eyes, goes in a trance, and then the writing comes through her. The book was about walk-ins, aliens who come and take over your body in your sleep. A person can actually not die and still become a whole different person. They wake up one morning and can't remember who the they were. I wrote about how love comes walking in and can make you a whole new person. After Valerie forced Eddie to listen to the lyrics, Eddie and I became the closest of collaborators, trusting and loving each other from that point forward. Before I joined Van Halen, I was already committed to Farm Aid in September 1985, and we decided that would be the place we would make the announcement. I wanted to really do this 
big time. I rented a private plane for my band for our last show. I gave everybody a nice bonus. They had all bought homes already, but I gave them enough to pay it off, if they wanted. I brought Eddie up to rehearse with us. Eddie and I wrote three songs in two days while he was in town. We rehearsed Led Zeppelin's Rock and Roll with Eddie for Farm Aid. It was going to be great. Too bad I screwed everything up. At Farm Aid, you can only do three or four songs. Willie Nelson, John Cougar Mellencamp, and Neil Young organized the 12-hour marathon fundraiser that was broadcast live on radio and television, largely a country show with acts like Chris Christopherson and Jimmy Buffett. It wasn't a rock show. Dylan was as hard-rocking as it had gotten when my turn came. I was going to open with One Way to Rock and follow up with I Can't Drive 55 and bring out Eddie, make the announcement that I was joining Van Halen and play rock and roll. When I went out right away, I had that stadium rocking. They love me. We're going crazy. I was scoring. It was big for me, 90,000 people in Champaign, Illinois, one of my biggest regions. I could do two nights in Chicago, two nights in Champaign, two nights in Peora. Illinois was my state. I was ripping it up when I stepped to the mic to introduce I Can't Drive 55. Here's a song for all you tractor pulling mother I said, and instantly they shut down the radio broadcast and turned off the live TV feed. I ruined everything. When I brought out Eddie, we were long off the air and nobody saw or heard a thing. He did a quick little solo. We made the announcement and went into the Led Zeppelin number. That was the first time we played together in public. Eddie was on the plane with us. We all flew back happy. It was a friendly transition from my band to Van Halen. Many years later, David Wasser went to a cattle call audition for drummers for Maria McKee. The former vocalist of Lone Justice, this country rock band signed to Geffen that was going to follow us at Farm Aid. Back then, they thought they had the Eagles and Linda Ronstadt all rolled together, but Lone Justice were not to be. A number of years later, the singer was looking for a drummer, and Wasser looked like he was going to get the job. He's down to the final interview with the lady herself, and she says, Tell me about yourself. What have you done in the past? Wasser says, I've worked for Sammy Hagar all my life. She gets up and walks out of the room. I guess there was still some animosity about that. I didn't mean to do anything wrong. When I first went down to join Van Halen, I moved into a rented house, but then a place in foreclosure came up for sale next door to Eddie and Valerie in Malibu. They lived on a bluff, a little house in the middle, and my house. It was all brand new, but the contractor went under, and the bank had it. I made them a ridiculously low offer, and got the house. I moved in next door to Eddie. It was amazing that a place would come up on Broad Beach Road, one of the most desirable spots in North Malibu, especially at bargain basement rates. It seemed like karma. Betsy was grooving. She dug the house and she liked the beach. She didn't care about Malibu, but there were houses right down the street. You can rent a villa in the south of France for what we paid for her house, the Malibu Stables. But she was happy. When I joined Van Halen, it shook up Betsy bad at first. She had been ready for me to slow down and get out of the business. She wasn't ready for me to start over with a totally new band. But when the house came up in Malibu, she started to see things differently. I would go to work every day and come home at night. We were recording the album and rehearsing for the tour. She was living in this beautiful beach house. She was living in this beautiful beach house. She had her roses in the garden and her horses down the lane. She drove either her brand new Jaguar or the Land Rover. I used to drive to the studio with Eddie every day. He and I had the cars. We either take the Ferrari, the Lamborghini, my E-Jag, or my Cobra. On the way into the studio one day, we drove past the dealer and saw an E-Jag sitting there. I stopped. I went in and got my business manager on the phone, handed the salesman the phone, and the two of them put the deal together. I went out to get in the car and drove to the studio. I slid in behind the wheel and... Wait a minute, what's with the seat? I'm not that big myself, but whoever drove this car before was one short dude. Whose car is this? It belonged to Ronnie James Dio. I love that. Eddie and I did crazy like that. We'd race home, me and one of my Ferraris, Eddie and one of his Lamborghinis driving 140, 150 miles an hour. He would always be drunk. Every day we'd go from 2 in the afternoon until past midnight, unless Al passed out. Al was a bad drunk, but Eddie used to nurse his beers. He'd always be drinking, but didn't get all up. Al would get 
up, puke, pass out. You'd have to slap him around, let him rest for a couple hours, get him up, and bring him back. We would limit the amount of beer he could have, and he would have to duck out for a pack of cigarettes, run downstairs, buy a bottle of vodka, and drink it in the store. Their father liked to drink, too. If we were in the studio at 2 in the afternoon, it wasn't like Eddie got up at 8 in the morning. More like noon. I'd get to the studio, and the three of them would be sitting there drinking, having gone through a couple of six-packs already. Their dad, Jan Van Halen, was a great guy. I felt close to him. He was a sax player. He liked my chops, liked that I could sing. But those guys drank. Al was a drunk like my father. He couldn't stop. He drank until he passed out, woke up, and started all over again. He would find people in bars and offer them money to put out a cigarette on their arm or shave their head while he videotaped the whole deal. Completely nuts. When I first made their scene, they were still laughing about Al's birthday performance. Legend has it they had all gone to Benny Hanna. He was already drunk when he got there. It's his birthday. He's drinking hot sake and everything else. He gets up on the table, takes his shirt off, and starts to dance right on the hot grill. The guy just finished cooking dinner for him. Al pulls his pants down to f*** with the people in the place. He trips himself because he's got his pants around his ankles and lands on the grill on his back. He can't get up. He flops over like prawns. Ah! 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 He couldn't do anything. He was on the grill. They had to pull him off and, of course, take him to the hospital. He had burns all over. Like Leffer said, these guys were crazy, very high maintenance, but good hearted. Another time, during the 5150 sessions, we were waiting for Claudio to bring back one of my cars around 2 in the afternoon. I bet you I could shotgun 10 beers, Al said. He got 10 talls of malt liquor. I bet you a thousand bucks, he said. Al's a betting man. One time he lost his BMW to me on a bet. I made him pay up too and gave it to our tour manager for Christmas. Al was a great guy, but just a total I was not betting him. Oh yeah, he said. Watch this. Michael Anthony was sitting there with me. Pow, 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 pow. Al opened them all first and then drained them one at a time. How can you even hold that much in your belly? I thought. Oh no, this day is over. Al walked out into the driveway, big belch, and grabbed a broomstick. My dad used to do this, he said. You ever see anybody do this? He was standing on the asphalt in the driveway, holding the broomstick out in front of him with both hands. I looked at him and wondered, What the is he doing? He's going to jump over the broomstick while holding it in his hands. At that moment, Claudio pulled around the corner in my car. Just as Claudio could see everything clearly, Al jumped over the thing, caught his feet of course, drunk, just shotgun 10 cans of malt liquor, and went down face first. He didn't let go of the broomstick. We had to take the broom out of his hands. He hit the ground face down and lay there, out cold. Claudio jumped out of the car screaming, Call an ambulance, he said. Oh my god, he's dead. He did hit hard. The momentum of trying to do it catapulted his head into the asphalt. When we picked him up, he had a pizza face. They took him away in an ambulance. I went home, took the next day off, and the day after that, I came in. Al was lying on the couch, his head wrapped up like a mummy. I laughed at him so hard, but he couldn't laugh. That only made it worse. He really did some pretty good damage to his face. That was just starting to make the record. You can only imagine what the tour was going to be like. When it came time to actually record the album, we needed a new producer because Ted Templeman, who was producing David Lee Roth's solo albums, had supposedly been bad rapping us to Warner Brothers behind our back, so we weren't going to work with him. Despite Mo Austin's positive reaction when he'd heard us at 5150 and the fact they weren't paying much for it, Warner Brothers was hardly enthusiastic about the project. I suggested Mick Jones from Foreigner. I had known him from the Montrose days when he was still a spooky tooth, so Mick came on board and produced the album with us. One day toward the end of the project, Mick and I were walking on the beach when he turned to me and said, Give me one more song. That was Dreams. He just sort of pulled it over on me. I didn't know what key that song was in. I started singing in that register. Mick got really excited and helped me learn how to sing in this supersonic range that I had never done before. He pushed me into a range that was an octave above where I normally sang. Mick got me to do things I didn't know I could do. 
We cut the album quickly, no more than a month, but we got hung up mixing. It took longer to mix than we expected, because Eddie's studio really wasn't a great place to mix. We would do the mixes, take them home, and not like what we heard, so we had to do it all over again. We had to cancel dates we planned at the start of the tour in Alaska and Hawaii. We wanted to start in some remote place, because we were really concerned about how the people were going to respond to the new material. There was also the issue of the Van Halen catalog. I told the guys that I didn't want to be in a cover band. I was not going to do any shows until we had an album, and when we did, I didn't want to play too much of the old <laughs> They were totally down with that. We all decided to go out and make a stand. In the end, we were so late delivering the tapes that the album couldn't come out until a week after the first scheduled date on the tour. Rather than start in some faraway place, we began it all in Shreveport, Louisiana. Even though the album was late, we went ahead with the show, because it had already sold out and we didn't want to cancel it or postpone it. The single Why Can't This Be Love was out on the radio, so people had heard something, but they hadn't heard the album. We went to Shreveport, Louisiana to do that first show on March 27, 1987, and I was a wreck. I didn't think I would ever been more nervous before a show. We came out and opened with One Way to Rock, one of my songs. The barricade went down. The audience went crazy. It happened in an instant. A flash. It was killer. We knew we were on top of the world at that moment. The ironic thing about that date is that it had been predicted a couple years before by a psychic named Marshall Lever. I met him through this acupuncturist I had been seeing and went to visit him at his home in Sausalito for an appointment sometime during the recording of VOA. This was after I had severed my ties with the girlfriend and I was happy with the new baby Andrew, but I still knew things weren't right between Betsy and me. I felt the need to talk to someone. I needed some spiritual advice. His wife met me, this red lip woman, very goofy, who showed me into the room. This heavy set gentleman walked in, sat down in a rocking chair, leaned back, closed his eyes. His wife asked if I wanted to record the session and slipped a cassette into the tape recorder. His dog followed them into the room, lay down on the floor, and started snoring. Over the years, I had been to see this guy 20 times, and this was the routine. That dog is snoring on every one of my tapes. He started by telling me that I was involved in a relationship that I was just finishing. She was your sister in your past life in Greece, he said. You were separated when she was 9 and you were 11, and your parents were killed in a boating accident in the Greek islands. They put her in a covenant, and you went out on a fishing boat and never returned. You never saw her again, and you missed her. When you saw her and you smelled her... He's talking about the smell. This chick drove me crazy with her smell. When you smelled her, you realized who she was and you didn't ever want to be away from her again. He went on to tell me about Betsy. Betsy was also your sister in a past life, he said, and you lived in Spain. Neither one of you ever married. You were in love, but you never had sex because she was your sister and you lived together your whole life. Betsy was your big sister. Your mother died giving birth to you. Betsy cooked for you just like your wife, but she never had sex even though you were madly in love. You were an instrument maker named Cruelly. C-R-U-L-L-I. He spelled it out. And your instruments can be seen in a museum in Barcelona. He turned his attention to Betsy. When you meet your present wife, he said, you had an extremely strong sexual relationship and it's really what keeps you tied. That's really what we really had. Our sexual relationship was fantastic, even 20 years into it. How did he know all this? In 18 months, he said, you're going to go on a brand new adventure, very much like what you're doing now, but different, more powerful, bigger, more like this is it. That's when he gave me that date. He said it was going to start on that date. I refused to sing Jump. It was just hard for me. I write my own songs. Jump was tough for me lyrically. Can't you see me standing here? I got my back against the record machine. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I might as well jump. That was hard for me. I couldn't sing the song with any heart and soul. I gotta sing something that I mean. Hey, hey, hey you, who was it? Hey baby, how you been? I just couldn't sing that. Great as it was. The first night, in a moment of panic, I pulled a guy out of the crowd to sing it. The audience went nuts. The band thought it was great. When the guy got to I Might As Well, I'd spring in the air like a maniac. It worked. We kept it. On the entire tour, I sang Jump maybe twice. Before I joined the band, Van Halen didn't have a particularly tight show. 
Roth would talk, they'd do another song, Ed would play a 20 minute guitar solo, they would do another song, Roth would talk some more, another song, I would do a drum solo for 30 minutes. On the 1984 tour, they told me they were doing 8 songs in a 2 hour show, and they ended every song the same way. They had the classic heavy metal ending, 4 crashes, a crescendo, 1, 2, 3. At the end of that, Al would usually do something, smack this, clang that, just because he was quirky. I decided we needed a new ending. Great idea, said Eddie as always. So pounding beers, Al earned a new ending. Good. The next day at rehearsal, back to the same old ending again. If he learned it, he learned it for one day maximum. Nothing stuck. We kept the same ending on the tour. On the road, the crew worked around Al carefully, trying to figure out ways that he wouldn't pass out during the show. Al would sleep right up to the time before we went on stage. I would come to the dressing room from the hotel. I never did the sound checks to save my voice, and the two of them would be asleep on the couch or in a chair. They never went back to the hotel for their naps. Everyone tiptoed around them. Shh, let them sleep, they would say. Don't wake them up or Al will start drinking too soon. They would wake up Al in about 20 minutes before showtime. There was always a case of tall Schultz cans. He would shotgun three or four beers and get his buzz on. He would walk out on stage with a couple more cans in his hand, pound those and drink the rest of the case during the two hour show. The crew would put out these big rubber trash cans for him to piss in during the show. After practically every song, he'd piss in the trash can, pound a couple beers and start playing again. Sometimes he'd really be up. In the middle of a song, he'd just get up off the drums to take a piss or chug a beer. Eventually, he started wearing one of those helmets with beer holders on the sides and straws. At the end of the tour, he needed some help. This was the golden era of arena rock. I had been doing arena since 1982 and standing Hampton. I was raised on arena rock. Montrose opened for everyone in arenas. I never played nightclubs and theaters. I wouldn't even know what it was like. I was used to going out with these big moves, hands as far as you could stretch them, running across the stage, jumping as high as you could to get to those people in the back of the giant arenas. Van Halen was the classic arena rock act. At the end of our run, arenas had gone away. People started playing amphitheaters for more money. Arenas were smaller and more expensive. You couldn't bring a giant production into the amphitheaters. When we first started doing arenas, Ed Leffler and I came up with a way to streamline production and stage design so that we could sell an extra 2,000 seats in the back behind the stage. Those seats were pure profit. We didn't put a canopy on top of the lighting so people could see the stage. We raised the PA system. We learned all the tricks and invented a few of our own. When we were running through arenas after BOA, we made more money than the other bands because they weren't selling those last 2,500 seats. When I joined Van Halen, they had been draping off the back of the hall, cutting the capacity in half, and walking away with a few thousand dollars. On the 5150 tour, we designed the stage so that we could be seen from everywhere. The arenas were so big and grand and had roofs all the way to the back. You could extend your production as far back as you wanted, and you could have as many as 14 spotlights. When you came out, it was big time rock. It was loud. It was inside a building, and sound didn't just disappear like it does outdoors. The sound was contained in the hall. It was massive and thunderous, and the audience felt it in their chests. You could darken the entire building and then pow, hit these four little guys up there with four massive spotlights apiece. Arena Rock is how rock stars became rock gods. The 5150 tour, we built this giant stage with steel gratings that went up to another stage about eight feet higher, which went all the way to the back. That way I could work the crowd in the back. We had an eight foot lift where the drum riser was that was like another stage. I would go up there and Eddie would go up there. Mike would go up there. You could be closer to the rear sections than the front row, even exchange high fives with the crowd. We had two other platforms on each side. Our stage was massive. We had these trusses of lights that I had been using since the three lock box tour with catwalks on them. It came down as an X across the front of the stage at a point in the show, and I went up there and out over the audience 20 or 30 feet above their heads. We carried the show in 15 trucks, a huge amount of production, some special effects, but mostly sound, staging, and lighting. I was one of the first to use the headset mic so I could run around all over the place. We were all wireless. We used to come out on this massive stage and we wouldn't see each other again for 10 minutes. Eddie would be running one way, Mike would be jumping off in another direction, and I'd be somewhere else. 
Only Al was stuck where he was. Sometimes I'd put my hand up over my eyes so I could see where Eddie was on the stage. We kept our monitors out of sight, under grating on the stage, so the stage was clean except for the tall amps, and they were loud. If you went in front of either of those amps, you'd better hold your ear. Van Halen played loud. The PA had to be so loud because it was coming off the stage that loud. That was Arena Rock, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Rush, Van Halen, Rock Stars. Three weeks into the tour, we were sitting in Atlanta and Ed Leffler called a meeting. Billboard number one, he said. It was the first number one record for any of us. The album sold 600,000 copies the first week and another 400,000 copies the next week. It was on fire. It went platinum faster than any record in Warner Brothers history. Every one of our records did. When I was in the band, Van Halen was a huge quick seller. Every album went to number one. It was an unbelievable run. Well, that's the end of chapter 7. Let me know what you thought of chapter 7 in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoy. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.